Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Um, in the new film, The Burnt Orange Heresy, a beautiful art critic and his beautiful new lover travel to a beautiful estate to hang out with Mick Jagger and potentially steal art from a reclusive artist played by Donald Sutherland. Sounds like a perfect movie to me. Please welcome the stars of The Burnt Orange Heresy, Elizabeth Debicki, Klaus Bang, and director Giuseppe Capitandi. Let's hear it. Hey. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and I mean what I said at the beginning of that. It is a beautiful movie filled with beautiful people and it is a lot of fun to watch. Um, what made you want to adapt this book? What interested you in telling this story? Well, the fact that it's about truth at the end of the day. It's about how easy it is to you know, concoct a new uh, reality and sell it as the real thing. Yeah. Your, um, your character is... Uh, uh, we don't realize at the beginning how sort of bitter he is about the man that uh, he has ended up becoming when we meet him. That's true. I mean, he's, I think he's sort of trying to hide that he's got that. He's, I mean, he's taken a fall from grace, hasn't he? And, and now he's like trying to get back in the loop. But uh, there is absolutely a bitterness there. And, um, and that, that sort of does really weird stuff to him. There's a scene um, really in the, in the middle of the film that I loved where he asks your character to say the meanest thing about him that, that she could think of. And it's um, so absolutely narcissistic on his part. <laughs> and it's like the first time where I feel like your character is kind of taken aback or recognizing that sort of male narcissism that's coming out in that moment. Can you talk about playing that scene and, and, and doing that? I just, I love that moment. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great scene. I mean, I think I think you're right. There's a sort of what you watch is a sort of real time revelation of who this person is. It's such an interesting thing in life if someone was to say that to you, you know, especially somebody who you're trying to, in a really genuine way, connect to. Because I think um, Berenice, who I play in this movie, is is on a quest. She's so she's so lost at the beginning of the film and sort of attaches herself, almost a sort of barnacle in a way. She just sort of like cinches onto this person. And her willingness to do that makes her vulnerable, but it's also a really interesting study in how willfully blind we can make ourselves to people's true nature when we want something from them. It's interesting in this film because everybody wants something, but everybody wants something very, very different, um, just like real life. And, um, and in that moment, she's sort of confronted with the truth of who he is, and it's it's really not pretty. And um, I loved playing that. It's so well written that scene. And um, she doesn't want to do it. She doesn't want. She's really <laughs> reluctant, and <laughs> yet, do it. and yet, when she sort of unlocks it, it sort of unspools from her, and it's 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 sort of brutal. It's, it's quite brutal in a way, and actually. I remember playing that scene. There's a moment where I grab, I grabbed Clayus's face, which I feel like just happened one take. And um, and I I remember when I did it, I wanted to kind of like pop his head open a little. <laughs> it's the one we. So uh, there's a violence in it, you know, because for the for a second she's telling the truth, and and um, yeah, it, yeah. There's, that's interesting that you say uh, everybody wants something different, but at, for a while in the film your character is kind of, I don't want to say just the barnacle, but she's not expressing what she wants. I shouldn't have said she's a barnacle. That's a terrible thing to say. <laughs> Carbuncle. It's a terrible thing. A little bit she is. But she is. I mean, yeah, she sort of latches on, yeah. Yeah, and so it's not clear what she wants or if she wants anything because she doesn't seem to be a person who is sort of motivated by that knowledge, a very, a very clear knowledge of what she wants. Mm -hmm. Yet when she eventually figures that out or expresses it, that's when... I mean, I don't want to give anything away, but something else entirely is unlocked from him. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a kind of misogyny where it's like as soon as she speaks her mind in any way, it becomes a horror show. Well, it's a threat. Yeah. Um, because up until the point where she does speak her mind and sort of express herself or her right to sort of any kind of will over, some, over him, you know... Um, and the imbalance of how it has been playing along is suddenly made blatantly clear to him. And the threat, I think, is that she might sway him from attaining the thing he wants to attain and and stop him achieving, you know, his goal in that moment, I suppose. Um, 
that, uh, I mean, it, and of course it's hard to say anything about it by not give anything away, but um, it, it becomes, I, I suppose it, it, it's interesting in a way, you would have something to say about this, that it is such a threat to him that he has to impose an equal or more amount of resistance back at her. Um, but in that moment, she sort of falls into her own humanity in a way by sort of, um, it's almost like we watch her wake up and remem remember that she can. Um, she knows what's she, right. Yes, in that moment, yeah, she knows she knows what's right, and therefore, at the same time, she remembers who she is. Yeah, an instance of moral clarity that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which I feel what I loved playing about her was in a movie where we can never trust who we we don't know which narrator to trust, and we don't quite know whose eyes we're seeing through or who's seeing with the most sort of objective clarity. I suppose. Um, she constantly presents herself as an honest kind of viewpoint. And we never know if we can trust her, and we don't really know if we can. Um, I mean, everybody's moral compass is murky and some murkier than others. But um, oh, I've lost my train of thought. What was I saying about? I about nobody really believes her Yeah, when she tells the truth. Yeah, yes. And I suppose at the end of the day, that's the ultimate form of disempowerment in a way. Well, no one believes her when she tells the truth. And when she does finally speak up, you know, what happens, happens. Right. Yeah. Um, what, I want to go back to the scene where you ask her to say the worst thing about you. What did that scene mean to you about that character? Mm, well, first of all, I, I, I think there were so many great scenes. I mean, this is what attracted me to the film in the, in the beginning, all the scenes that Berenice with, with Berenice and James, because I think it's, it was just something as an actor, you just want to dive right in and just start doing it because they're so well written and they're so, it's, it's, it's really all the variations and it's like really taking a piece of music and then just playing it, but slightly very, with variations all the time. I mean, it's like, and getting that balance right to sort of always, I, th I think that's probably what the film is made of, that you sort of slide around the truth all the time. And, 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 and I think it was important that we sort of knew that this is what we're doing right now. And I think that is actually something that is, is very, um, what is that? It's very, you, you just want to do it. You really have an appetite for it. It's really sort of, wow, this is, this is good fun. As an actor, this is like, this, this thing and and with that scene um i remember quite clearly all of a sudden that that moment when you grabbed my head and i thought oh fuck this is not very nice but this works beautifully for what's going on here so i'll just fucking deal with it or try and stay in it or yeah but it's yeah and i yeah but it was so but it, it felt it was exactly right and the impulse was just there and you just did it and i was like fuck what's going on my head is gonna pop but that's what you wanted <laughs> I, I, I also thought there was a um uh for lack of seeming creepy a sexiness to that moment as well the way that she grabbed your face i didn't necessarily it was violent but it was also kind of like this is the er the charged erotic energy right the two well of the line is usually quite blurry isn't it yeah yeah but i mean oh, who is it <laughs> no but really? I it can be but i suppose that's sort of what Attra film. attracts these people to each other isn't it that they have that sort of playfulness where it becomes a little bit sexy and it's a little bit, I mean, are you lying to me or are you someone else? I mean, they. I think they both enjoy that game. I mean, they start playing it, I mean, from the beginning. I can be this, we can move to Philadelphia, we'll have two kids. Uh, is your name really Berenice? And she says, I mean, who would make a name like that up? And, and I mean, they have that thing going on all the time. It's like, it's, it's, it's almost as if it's addictive to them to sort of play around with each other like that. And and they and it seems that they sort of enjoy that more than actually really finding out who are you. And I mean, so, so to stay in that sort of gray area of what is the truth is probably also what, I mean, gets to them in the end because they can't actually, for some reason she won't really say and and it 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 sort of makes perfect sense that she doesn't, but in a way, it, I mean. But she does. Does she does? Yeah. Just won't listen. Uh, yeah, I just won't listen, like I won't now. 
<laughs> um, also, I remember in that scene, there's a real fly flying behind you. I is there? Yes. Where? Yes. Behind you, when she actually grabs your face. Is there? Yeah. How did I we get that? One? I felt that. That was the moment. You know, I knew it. Oh, you saw the fly and then you just grabbed me. Oh, cool. Do you know how important are flies? Yeah, in yeah of course. Yeah. yeah. And th that's a real fly and it was there by chance. And you, did you see it while you were filming, or is I it something did. that you caught no, later? No, 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 I did. Room? I did say I saw it, and then I, you know, I did it, that scene. I used that scene. Magic. Magic. We got to fly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, talk about uh, shooting, crafting a, a sort of art heist thriller that's also not an art heist thriller at all. It's the tone and the sort of visual ideas of a thriller but on top of something that is people getting to know each other and talking and figuring things out. Yeah, well, you know, the um, dialogues were so sophisticated already in the script, and, and I thought that why don't we make it as if it's like an old school um, film noir, mm. you know, the, from Hitchcock to Chinatown. So we kind of used the tropes of the genre to, you know, tell this little story and having four people most of the time they're just talking, but <laughs> trying to make it, you know, s sort of mysterious and moody and give it a, you know, that look. Um, there's a seismic shift for your character uh, at one point in the film, again, not trying to give anything away. Um, as an actor, do you feel the need to sort of lay a, a breadcrumb trail from the beginning that this could happen with your character and we should be looking for that? Well, I think that depends on, on, on the story. And in this case, I think it was quite important, and we discussed this a lot, uh, that, that it is actually really important that James has got no idea where this is going to go and 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 that he has a potential something in there that we can't say because that's going to give it away but it's it's really important that it's that it's that he's as taken by surprise as as everybody else um I, I and and for some other other parts it might be sort of necessary to sort of lay out a little bit of something so to but but here I thought it was really important not to do that to sort of point it in any other direction so that it'll just take him by surprise, really. Um, we're having a conversation with some depth about the film, but how, what was it like working with Mick Jagger? <laughs> <laughs> horrible, Sorry, horrible. horrible. Uh, it was actually a lot of fun. He was really, he sort of brought, I think when you shoot, I mean, we shot this movie in 25 days and you sort of, there's a, there's a containment to the energy, there's a kind of focus that you need to have to, to make a film quickly like that and with Especially the intensity like, of it. Like this, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but this is slick and polished and is composed. Oftentimes I sit with people who shoot movies in 18 to 25 days and you can kind of tell, you know, for better or worse. Right. It looks like they had two cameras handheld and were just sort of cross-cutting as much as possible. Right. This does not look like that at all. Credit Congrats, to. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> Credit <you>. to. <laughs> it was um, very frustrating though. <laughs> it was? To shoot so quickly. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's funny because what it does as an actor is it just sort of creates like a pressure cooker kind of situation. I mean, you you sort of, you crawl out the other end of it, but you, I don't know, there's a kind of weird joy to being able to just pour everything in for a condensed amount of time. It's, it's just the, dif the, the difference between a sort of marathon or a sprint, I suppose, and both make interesting work. So, um, But um, Mick sort of joined us I feel like sort of just past the midway point and he brought a kind of beautiful energy to the set really, like a lot of joy. He 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 has a kind of, um, there's a real playfulness to Mick, like a sort of childlike playfulness to him. And he, um, he I remember the one of the first takes um, he did, um, he sort of has more energy than you and I combined on our very best day, most caffeinated, you know, like he's just like, has this kind of thing that comes out of him. And uh, I remember he did one take, like one, maybe the first take and he sort of, someone said cut and I, I presume you, as you are the director, uh, some some guy, some Italian guy, and he kept talking to me the whole time. Um, sure. And sure, great hair. Um, and, uh, and, Mick, and, and Mick sort of like looked up at Clayus and I and went, Okay, good, good. And we were both like, yeah, yeah. It was you were a mate. It was fantastic. Doing great, Mick Jagger. Right, right, right. Um, but he, but I guess in that moment, I realized, oh, this is just like a. It's like a. 
it's almost like a piece of music in a way, like it's a collaboration and he he was sort of like really open to any kind of rhythmic shift or if it was sort of like, let's put a little bit more of this or move it over here or whatever. And f from where I stood as an actor working with him, it was a joy to work with him. And I love that um, dinner, oh, it was a lunch scene when, when he questions my character in this sort of very intense way. I remember wondering how it was gonna play and he suddenly had this sort of laser vision. It was really interesting. Well, that's, uh, it makes sense that he would have that kind of energy that you're talking about, but that doesn't necessarily come across with the character. He's wealthy, he's established, he's extremely confident, but he's kind of a lean back person who seems like he's, he's playing a game with everybody. And everybody is kind of his chess pieces that he, can, that he can play with. What was it like, did you feel like you had to tone down his energy at all when you were directing him? Well, a little bit, but I think he did it himself mostly. Um, you know, we talked about the character and, and he came up with some ideas like the accent this guy should have had and you know, the way he was dressed and how he envisioned his house, you know, uh, Cassidy's house. So I did, I think he did most of the job and of course you talk to an actor you know, yeah, and you try and to say how you see things. Um, but it was very collaborative, I must say. Um, you said a, a, a moment ago that uh, it, was, it could be frustrating to shoot the film that quickly. What were some of your biggest challenges? Time. Time. Money. Yeah. <laughs> the, but with those as the broad thing, what did that affect while shooting, if you don't mind me asking? Well, you know, there are some scenes that, even if I watch the film now, I mean, I, I was going like, hmm, I should have done this differently, or I should have had more time to do more takes, or, you know, different angles. I think that's, you know, the nature of the beast, anyway, so you, you can't really fight it. The more money, the more days, the more you want, I suppose. Um, but yeah, there are things that, you know, I would never say. <laughs> oh, of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, that I would have done differently if I had more money or more time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Donald Sutherland is also in the film, another legend in his own right. What was it like doing some scenes with Donald? Oh, horrible. Horrible? Yeah, I've heard awful Stop things. Stop saying oh, okay. that. <laughs> no, actually, like, pure joy, to be honest. Like, as an actor, just... Um, I mean, there's not many people who just just watching them process a note from a director or watch them manipulate the scene or shift or sort of you know shift the color or the, the tone of it it's sort of like a master class really in craftsmanship he's so such a specific actor so tr like actually mesmerizing to work with and and um has this sort of focus um that sort of bring, I don't know, it's really interesting doing a scene with him because it sort of centers the energy of it and um, nothing else really exists in that moment and, and he, like one hopes all actors are doing, but he really, really listens to you mm. and um, you find yourself really, really listening to him and uh, sort of strangely, I mean, the, char the, the characters that we play have this very sort of um, mutual kind of, understand what I love about what happens in their relationship is um, in a movie where people are sort of obscuring the vision of other people or masking themselves they sort of unmask and let each other see each other because they sense a kind of kindred um, almost intention sort of like they're shedding something with each other sort of a purity of um, what does it actually mean to be here what's what's even the point and maybe the point is that we're just two people listening to each other and sort of speaking our stories, you know, honestly. And also Donald is sort of like that as a human being and you you couldn't, um, you couldn't fib, fib. Is that an Australian thing to say? Fib? Fib, no, lie. Lie, yeah, no, yeah, fib is a, yeah. yeah. You couldn't sort of, you can't really, man he'll see it. Right. He'll see right through what you're doing. Um, yeah, I mean, he's he's been around. Oh yeah. 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 Um, you have uh, you were in uh, the square, which I told you in the green room. I think is one of the masterpieces of the last ten Thank years you. or I'm so. Very proud of that film. Uh, and you're also on Netflix's Dracula. Mm -hmm. And you're in this. These are three tonally just vastly different projects. Mm -hmm. How does that change for you as an actor? Is that do you think about the overall tone when you go into a piece, or do you just do your job and think that the tone will come through? No, of directly? course, I mean, I mean, I think, well, this one and the square are sort of perhaps sort of in the same tone in that, I mean, it's quite naturalistic, realistic, 
um, where Dracula perhaps is slightly elevated, heightened, elevated, yeah. heightened. Um, uh, not, I mean, it, it has sort of that adventure sort of thing where. So, 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 I think for that you need the acting to perhaps. I mean, I still try and and really get it real because 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 um, that's the only thing that I can sort of really trust. I think that's what's in here. So that's what I try to go with. I just try to find something that resonates with me. Um, and then hopefully, I mean, obviously, when you're in a castle like that in Dracula and everything is lit by candlelight, it's, it, it just does something to the whole thing. And, and that sort of brings that gothic thing to it. And here, I mean, so it, it's very much sort of letting those things sort of affect you. So, so, so I, 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 but there is, an, but I suppose it's all also in the writing, isn't it? For Dracula, it's in the writing too. They have sort of made sure that it's sort of slightly elevated in the way that it's written. So it's actually just leaning in and just trusting that and trusting the people around you and yourself in a way. Yeah. Uh, I have a question coming in from Twitter, and it's a uh, class. You seem to be drawn to films in the art world. <laughs> Are you interested in art outside of film, and do you find yourself looking at it differently after the roles you play? Smiley face. Well, I've always been an art buff. I've always enjoyed going to museums, and and so so so. I mean, and please observe the pop Dracula. Wow, that's cool. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm not exactly drawn to, to films in, that are set in the art world. It's just a coincidence that I've done like a lot that sort of has an element of, of that in it. Um, but it's, I mean, I think what happens here is that the fun thing with this film is that it almost becomes like a meta layer because it points to, to the film it, as, a, as a work of art itself. And I mean, like the, like, like, like the painting in the film that is, I mean, everybody says, now this is a real Depney, and we all know it's not. Um, but it's so, so art is really, and I, my character says it from the beginning, listen, it's, it's um, you, I can't be trusted. Don't trust people like me, I'm an art critic. I'll, I'll just tell you any lie. Um, so trust yourself. And I think that's the same thing with the film also. I mean, I mean, it's always a seduction. It's always a manipulation, isn't it? And if you, and if you numb yourself to that, you're not going to get anything out of it. You have to open yourself up to being seduced. But that also sort of allows other people to fuck with you. Um, and, and this is like a very interesting balance. And I think when films are set in the art world and they are about a piece of a, a work of art, they sort of get that meta layer where they sort of almost point to themselves in a very interesting way. Um, because you question, and I know, and I did not know this until you pointed it out to me, that there is, in the beginning of the film, we actually reveal, when we're going down that hallway, that it is a set. So you can actually see, in the beginning of the film, that this is gonna, this is just a lie. Just, just for a few frames. It's just like a few end. frames in the beginning. You, you can the actually end of the see. Build, which is made in CGI anyway, so <laughs> I asked the CGI guy to, you know, create the end of the set as to if alert, it was a build. To alert the audience that, to just sort of call attention to the Yeah, it's right. Well, you have to, look, you have yeah, to yeah. look very look carefully out. to see it, yeah. but, it's, but it's just to sort of say, this is an illusion. Mm. Right. This is not real. But it can still be a super cool. But there are many Easter eggs like, like that. But I, but I, that that is very appealing to me. That whole thing of playing around with, I mean, what does it look like to you? What do you get from it? Does it is it a piece of is it a work of art for you or is it, some, is it not? Or I mean, that thing. Or is it only a work of art for you because you've been told it's a work of art? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And do you yeah. believe it? And and should you trust it? And oh my God, it's uh, I've I've. Uh, I mean, I've got a, another film coming out shortly about forgeries in the art world, and and when it's <laughs> and when so they're right, there is a they, pattern, there is a clearly. weird thing about that. But the thing is that I mean, when it's revealed in that film that they're forgeries, they go from being like worth millions and millions of pounds to being worth nothing, and it's exactly the same painting. Nothing has changed. Two seconds ago, everybody would be able to, would, would be willing to pay, I don't know how much for it, and now nobody wants it. Um, and that's really interesting, because it's like the same thing. But it, it really comes down to how you view it and how you look at it. And, 
And I think that that whole discussion is really interesting. And I think the film really points to that discussion in a very interesting way, because it is, as Giuseppe said, it's about, I mean, the truth will always be about where you view it from. I mean, it can look very different for you and me. Um, I think we have a question from the audience. Aubrey, hi. Hi. Uh, my question is, if you could steal any piece of art, what would it be and how would you do it? Whoa. Any. Mm. What would it be? I mean, obviously for me, it would be like a Mission Impossible type thing where I'm crawling underneath the beams and so, yeah. Lasers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I look like Tom Cruise circa 96 as well, like... <laughs> Which is exactly like now. <laughs> yes, that is true. Oh my God. That is a really interesting question. I, 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 I. Didn't somebody recently just walk into a gallery and take it off the wall and walk straight out? Where did that happen? Uh, I think you're right. I vaguely remember seeing the headline. It, somewhere in Europe. Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Europe. That mystical land. Um, I think if I was going to do it, I would probably try something like that. I would try, I would sort of think, I know I'm not, if there were lasers, I'm cooked, done. <laughs> if there was any kind of escape route, I'd screw it up. Like I'm not, yeah, less stunts the better. So I think um, I would just probably try something incredibly obvious because I think that's probably how that person got away with it, right? You just, you can do unbelievable things under people's noses when they just don't expect you're gonna do it. Um, uh, but I th so probably something small, um, maybe like a tiny Rauschenberg, maybe like a Rauschenberg, like a little piece of like, you know how he did all those little prints or, you know how he has those, those little like, um, miniature sort of like toys or something. I'd probably just nick a few of those, chuck them in my pocket and, um, really buy you a don't house. Wanna you don't want to train for like a month or like a sort, like get a team of misfits together that you're not sure if they can pull it off or anything? I'm... No, because I can see the reviews already. I'm not right. quite sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I do something little and small. What would I steal? I don't know. I've, I've or get someone really famous, like really famous, to totally just massively distract the crowd. Oh, yeah. Like actually get Tom in to do like a Mission Impossible stunt. Like he swings through the, you know, like distract. All he has to do is walk in and shine those pearly whites. People will get distracted. Exactly. Yeah. Then I'll take an enormous thing. Walk out forward. with anything. Yeah. So you'd just get him in there, stand there, and everybody would be looking at him, and you'd just grab something and run. Yeah, and it's a flawed plan. I'm going to take the tiny Rauschenberg. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a good plan. I think it will work. I would, I would, I would probably. Yeah. Yeah. You're going with her plan? I think the plan is very good. Um, I'm, I'm not very good at planning. So non-committal. No, you need your own art heist plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm trying to think of something. You should uh, I do can't it first really. first and then I, if it I, works. I think I, I'd really love to try that thing that he does, you know, being, yeah, yeah, that, or, yeah. So I'd probably go for something like that. I'm sure I probably would fuck it up with the laces and everything, but still, I'd try it. Um, and, oh my God, I wish I could come up with something really, really, original, but I'd probably steal a Van Gogh or something, because I really think that I'd love to have something like that on my wall. Or wouldn't. Pardon? Or wouldn't. No, that's what I mean. But it's like, but it's also very, a very conservative and boring kind of thing to steal. I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously pretty, but wouldn't that be something out there that would be sort of more crazy? A Debney. You could be specific about Van Gogh if you wanted to, if there's, if you wanted a to be A specific one. Original, I guess. I'm not trying to challenge you. I'm, try I'm trying to help. <laughs> yeah, but I can't now. I can't. I can't choose now. Uh, yeah, that would be the problem. Okay, so you get yourself in the museum you in Van Amsterdam. Go museum. You've got 200 Van Goghs, and now you're re um, you got past all the lasers. You got every. Oh my God! And then you're faced with the problem: which one do I pick? And then you get caught because and then you, you get just caught. Stayed you in there stand so there for looking, until yeah. they until they open the next day, and you're still standing there mesmerized, thinking, "Which one am I gonna get?" <laughs> arrest me! Be. I can't decide. Yeah, arrest me! I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> just Abby, do you have a, a art heist plan or art that you? No, no. Like I let them go first, and then let's see. Let them get caught, yeah, yeah. and then you walk in after. <laughs> That's an idea. Oh well. <laughs> Thank you. I'll try that. 
Any particular artist that you would that you would want? Contemporary? Yes. Peter Doig. Oh, okay. Who? Exactly. Yeah. That was Peter me Doig too. I just did a, a really a pun. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. He's yeah, a British yeah, painter. Come on, guys. Great. Yeah. <laughs> um, guys, uh, I love the film. Congratulations. Incredible. Thank you. Thank you. This beautiful direction. Um, when can people see it? When does it come out? It's this, coming out this, tomorrow, this Friday, tomorrow, isn't right? It? This Friday? Yeah. This tomorrow. Friday in theaters. Tomorrow. It's yeah. called The Burnt Orange Heresy. Go see it in the theaters. Giuseppe did a wonderful job shooting it. It looks beautiful. Thank you. Uh, and give everyone a round of applause for being here. Let's hear it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.